So a couple of months ago, a buddy of mine gave me an older gaming PC that was no longer being used. He was interested in seeing how well this 7-year-old gaming PC holds up today. Now, I rarely ever turn down free PC parts, so I gladly accepted the offer. He dropped the PC off to me, and at first glance, the case brought back some memories, as I've owned many of these in the past. But before I get sidetracked with that, let's open this bad boy up and take a quick look. Well, at first glance, the PC was pretty dusty inside, and there were some cobwebs making a nice home around the video card. The CPU cooler had some dust caked inside of the heatsink, which is kind of hard to see here, but the rest of the components looked a lot less dirty. The PC came with a 1TB drive, but understandably my friend wanted that back, so I just needed to give the PC a thorough clean and grab a hard drive for it. So in lazy man fashion, I grabbed a leaf blower and blew the sucker out. Now I normally use compressed air and hold the fan blades and yada yada yada, but I don't care, as this case wasn't going to be the primary home for the setup anyways. My buddy told me this was a Phenom 2 quad core, but he didn't know the exact model number. So I removed the heatsink, and in typical PGA fashion, the CPU came out with it. The thermal paste seemed to be cemented on, so when I finally got the CPU separated from the stock heatsink, it appeared to be a Phenom 2 X4 945. Now there were two versions of this chip, one had a TDP of 95 watts, while one had a TDP of 125, and it seems I got the 125 version. Now on to the motherboard, the Gigabyte 870A UD3. It's a motherboard that was released back in mid-2010 for around 110 USD. It uses the 870 North Bridge with the 850 South Bridge. As far as its features, it supports core unlocking, USB 3.0, SATA 3, and as far as overclocking goes, the 8 plus 2 phase VRM should be good up to 1.45 volts with this chip without the VRM heatsink. I might have one that could fit with some slight modification, so we'll see if I can use that in the future. But if I can't, I'll have to point an Antec spot fan or a case fan to help keep the MOSFET temps in check. So it really just depends on how well the chip responds to overclocking, and we'll cover that more so in another video. Memory-wise, the system came with 4GB of RAM and two 2GB DIMMs. It's the G-Scale Ripjaws memory, and they run at CL9, and they run at 1600 MHz. Now let's move on to the power supply, as it's made by Antec. Well, actually it's made by Delta, but it's still a very decent power supply nonetheless. It's 80 plus certified, has very good voltage regulation, and it's in great shape and more than enough for this build. Now the HD6850 is one that I've covered a bit too much lately, and to be frank, I'm kind of sick of looking at it. Actually, I take that back, it's quite sexy. If you watched my recent review of it, then you already know what it's capable of. But we're going to see how it does in a system from the same time frame. With the one terabyte hard drive gone, I needed some storage. So I grabbed a super cheap Patriot 60 gigabyte SSD off Amazon so I could have a decently fast boot drive. I also had a Western Digital 500 gigabyte mechanical drive laying around, so I used that to put all the games on. Now onto the case that housed all these goodies. This one is made by Ultra, and it's called the Wizard. Now this case may strike a chord with some of you older system builders out there, as it was a pretty popular unit back in the day. Now for airflow, there's a single 120mm fan in the back and an 80mm fan out front. This particular case is missing the lockable front door, which leaves it feeling a bit naked. I will be moving this entire setup to my Dell XPS 720 case when it's done being modified. Sadly, I will miss a sweet bottom-mounted 2-inch driver that plays my sweet post beats. Since this isn't 2011, I don't plan on using the DVD driver floppy, but they will stay in as I don't want gaping holes in front of the case. For the testing today, I decided not to overclock the CPU or GPU. I will be adding more RAM and overclocking the CPU for comparison tests in the future, so please keep that in mind. Now here's the configuration of the system as tested. Also keep in mind, since this system has only 4GB of memory, it will be accessing the page file quite often, and I've seen usage in upwards of 7GB in many of the games that I've tested. Alright, let's jump into our first game, Fortnite. Now we tested the game at 1080p with low settings, and it ran surprisingly well. We averaged 72 frames per second in our 6 minute capture. As a note, I adjusted the frame time graph in Afterburner to peak at 100 milliseconds so we can get a good idea of the large jarring stutters, but we do lose out on seeing micro stutter. Now speaking of stutters, we saw a fair amount of larger ones in our capture. These were felt in-game, but they didn't take away from the overall experience too much, 
we did also see some bottlenecking due to the CPU. Next up is Rainbow Six Siege, and here we use a low preset at 1080p. Now we average 47 frames per second using the built-in benchmark, but we experienced very similar results in our gameplay test as well. I didn't see any evidence of a CPU bottleneck, as the GPU was pegged at 99% during all of my testing. There were some large stutters in the beginning and at the end of the benchmark, but in between we saw some very tight frame times. Now let's take a look at a game that really shouldn't be anywhere near this system. Ghost Recon Wildlands. Now using the low settings at 720p, this little system mustered 27 frames per second on average. Now obviously that isn't great, but it's still surprising given how demanding this game is. GPU usage was good hovering in the 90% range through the majority of the test. And here's a look at our frame times as well, which isn't unrealistic with this setup. Now let's test a game that's a bit easier to run, Overwatch. Now we use the medium settings at 1080p with 100% resolution scale. We averaged 62 frames per second in our 9 minute capture. The CPU was holding us back a little bit as GPU usage hovered in the 80 to 90% range much of the time. We did see a fair amount of micro stutter along with a fair amount of large 100 millisecond swings in our frame times. Despite all of the frame time drama, subjectively the game still felt alright when playing through this match. PUBG is still one of the most popular games out right now, so we gotta look at performance. We used the very low preset at 720p with 100% resolution scale. We averaged 37 frames per second in our capture. Frame times were just okay, as we frequently saw 100 millisecond and larger spikes. GPU usage was surprising, but this GPU doesn't see 99% load even with a much faster CPU. I look forward to seeing what this CPU can do in this game with a stronger non-legacy GPU and some more memory. Now it's time to look at CSGO performance. I selected the low settings at 1080p with 16x AF and no AA. Here we averaged 72 frames per second in our capture. Frame times were pretty solid for the most part with some stutters here and there. GPU usage was hovering in the high 80s and 90s in our capture as well. Not a terrible result for the Inferno map. Come on, Roach is up next, and here we're testing the medium preset with no post-processing. We averaged 33 frames per second in our capture, and frame times were not terrible as they can be with this game. Yes, we saw a handful of large 100 millisecond spikes, but the smaller 20 millisecond ones were not really felt too harshly. GPU usage was very good, hovering in the high 90% range during much of the benchmark capture. Now let's jump back into a newer title, Destiny 2, and here we use the medium preset at 720p. We averaged 34 frames per second. Now I did test a demanding portion of this game, so the system got hammered pretty hard. Frame times were a bit messy as shown on screen, and this game doesn't allow the use of an OSD, so you won't be able to see any of the other information. After looking at the resource monitor when I was done benching, I did notice the CPU was getting hit pretty hard, hovering in the 90% range much of the time, and the GPU was being held back as well. GTA 5 is the second to last game we were testing, and here we chose 1080p with 16x AF and everything else set to normal. We averaged 55 frames per second in our run of the built-in benchmark. Frame times were actually very good for the most part, but we did see some huge frame spikes, which were very noticeable. CPU usage as expected was pegged at 100%, and the Phenom did hold the 6850 back a little bit. Also, texture poppin' was really bad, and to the point of being comical. And the last game in our roundup is Middle Earth Shadow of War, and here we use the very low preset at 720p. We averaged 29 frames per second in our capture of the built-in benchmark, and frame times were bad in some parts, and in others they were okay. GPU usage was in the 90% range most of the time, signifying a slight CPU bottleneck. This isn't as bad as I thought it might be considering the specifications of the system. Though it was weird hearing the enemies talk junk about my PC. <laughs> I heard the talk only has one gigabyte of VRAM. Well that wraps up our gaming test. I do plan on testing power consumption and temperatures, but that would be part of another video in the future. So what are my thoughts about this 2011 gaming PC in 2018? Well, in some ways I was surprised, and in others, I wasn't. Clearly trying to run games like Ghost Recon Wildlands and Shadow of War was pretty unrealistic, but it was still interesting to see what it could do. I could happily play Fortnite, Overwatch, and plenty of other less demanding games without too many issues on the system.
I do plan on testing this system more in depth in the future as I want to overclock the CPU, install more RAM, and maybe try a modern day graphics card as well. Before I sign off, I've had a number of people ask how they could help support the channel, so I've added Amazon affiliate links for multiple countries in the description. I'm also now a Humble Bundle partner, so please check out the description if you're interested in Humble Monthly or any games sold on there. Anyway, that should wrap up my sales pitch. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments section. And as always, thanks for taking the time to watch the video.